relationships the last several weeks, and today is our last Sunday in this series. We've been talking about barriers, four barriers that prevent us from connecting with others and connecting with God. If you can look at the slide up there, the first barrier was pride. We take a ride with pride. The second barrier was avoidance. Third is boredom. And number four, the fourth barrier I think is, I don't know if it's bigger in pride, it's right up there with it. And we're gonna talk about what that fourth barrier is in just a few moments. So just hold on. Now, a few weeks ago, if you remember, I was preaching up here and I wore some fairly new white tennis shoes. My wife got them for me on her birthday, but I still have kept them white and clean and neat. And it reminded me when I was a little kid growing up in school, in elementary school probably, uh, sometimes my parents would go and buy me a new pair of shoes. Back then, all we had was white tennis shoes. And we had basically about two choices. Either you could get the white Chuck Taylor high top Converse or the PF Flyers. Come on, old people, the PF Flyers. Yes, they don't make them anymore. Don't know what happened to them. But, so I'd get my new sneakers and I would go to school and you're in the first part of the day and right in little homeroom class. And one of your friends says, hey man, you got some new tennis shoes. I go, yeah. And then they would go and step on my new, brand new, pristine sneakers. You go to the next class, talk to another friend, sees it, hey, you got some new shoes. They would step on my shoes. I would see another friend, step. By the time you got to recess and lunch with the five cents chocolate milk carton, you had tracks all over your new shoes because someone was always doing you a favor and they were stepping on it. Stepping on your shoes. Now, life really is a series, many ways, if you look at it negatively, of getting stepped on, isn't it? Because, you know, if you live long enough, something's gonna happen in your life where Someone doesn't just step on your, your shoes, they step on your heart. They, they step on your soul. And what can happen to us if we're not careful is there can become a buildup in our lives, a buildup in our hearts, where we don't deal with the number of times that people have cross boundaries with us. We don't deal with the injustices that have come into our life in a good and God honoring way. And when we do that, we fall prey to this fourth barrier called resentment. Resentment. Now, I've never dealt with resentment, but I know some of you have. <laughs> so I'm gonna continue on with the message. So, so I'll pray for you, but resentment. Resentment's a biggie. Resentment's right up there with pride. Resentment can sneak up on you. And it's not just people who are all just hmm, scowling and mad and angry who deal with the resentment. It can be someone with a nice, cool, calm, hey neighbor, a nicest guy in the world kind of temperament. But internally, internally, they're resenting. What, is, what does it mean to resent? What does resentment mean? Well, when you break down the word into two parts, the word uh, re means again, and the word sent comes from the word sentir, in Spanish or French, which means to feel. So when you resent something or you resent someone usually, you're playing back something that happened in your past and you're re-feeling or re-experiencing that emotion. So there's a connection between fear, anger, and resentment. And thrown in there, it leads to a sense of disappointment and disgust. And resentment, if we're not careful, can easily build up in our life. You may have 
resentment to a parent. You may have resentment to a boss. You may have resentment towards a sibling or someone who was in your life in the past. It could have been a former friend, someone who betrayed you, someone who let you down, someone that led to an event that brought great pain and hurt into your life. And if you hold on to that long enough, it can grow into resentment. Someone said that resentment is holding on to anger too long. It's holding on to anger too long. And here's what gets us about resentments. It's the repetitive nature of this strange form of self-punishment that we engage in. It's like when someone sends you like a, I don't know, like a TikTok or a YouTube video. You ever, ever happened to you, someone sent that to you? Hey. Did you, did you watch that video I sent you? Did you watch that TikTok? Did you see it? Did you watch it? And they send you these, these clips. And sometimes the clips are good. Sometimes the clips are not good, right? No, come on, really? But if it's a good clip, man, I'm gonna save that thing. Why? Because I wanna go back to that clip, watch it again, share it with friends, because usually it makes me laugh. It's funny. Or if it's a little clip that maybe gets, inspires me. But, but I watch it again and again and again because of the emotion it elicits. So here's what happens to us with resentment. We kind of have this resentment playlist. We have a resentment playlist. And we go back to that moment. We go back to that time. We go back to that experience. We go back to that pain. We go back to that injustice and we play it again and again and again and again and again. And we re-experience that emotion. We re-experience that rejection and shame and guilt with that event and it makes us matter and matter and matter or it brings us down and makes us sadder and sadder and sadder. I sound like a Dr. Seuss book, but you know what I'm talking about. Resentment. We replay it. And it begins to grow and fester in our life. It's a dangerous, dangerous, negative emotion, hard feeling that we need to get out of us, right? And by the way, here's what's interesting. We don't have to go, hey Siri, play my resentment playlist. No. We don't have to do that. All it takes is to hear a song, a scene in a movie, a text someone sees, sends you. You're going down the road and some idiot, some person pulls out in front of you. And that can trigger a old past wound, a resentment, and you go, man, I've got some, I've got some unhealthy anger going on inside of my life. Perhaps there's something there. But resentment, when we hold on to it, because that's what we talk about, right? We, we talk about harboring resentment. I'm gonna harbor that resentment. I'm gonna keep that resentment with me. I'm gonna keep that bitterness, that unforgiveness with me because it gives me power. It protects me. It gives me a, an armor to protect me from further harm. But here's what happens with that armor. When the storms of life come, you drown in the water and the weight of resentment. Heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, cancer, all kinds of physical maladies that we have, many of them, if you peel through all the stuff, at the core is this sense of holding on to resentment. Here, here's what resentment does to you. Look at, look at Job 5.2. Job is the oldest book Again, this Bible is thousands and thousands of years old. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Here's what the book of Job said. It said, resentment kills a fool and envy slays the simple. Resentment kills you. Resentment kills me. 
holding on to the anger and the bitterness too long will kill us physically and emotionally, and it kills others around us. Resentment kills others because resentment spills out onto other people that we know and other people that we love. It's a dangerous thing. Oh, I'm not gonna deal with it. I'm not gonna bother with it. I'm not gonna address it. I'm just gonna shove it down or I'm just gonna lean into it because I feel like it protects me. No, resentment is so, so dangerous because when you don't deal with resentment, resentment can evolve. It can evolve into a sense of retaliation and the retaliation can evolve into a sense of plotting revenge to get back, to get even. And then that resentment and that revenge and that retaliation can literally ruin your life. Jose Altuve said, holding on to resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You're saying, Jose Altuve didn't say that. I know he didn't, but I've seen this quote, you know, given to I don't know, Jesus, Buddha, Socrates. Why not Altuve? He does everything else, right? He could have said that. But whoever said it is wise. Whoever said it has traveled down that road of resentment and has drunk that poison. Hey, I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna drink it. And I think that the person that I'm resenting again, it's gonna affect them. It doesn't affect them. Dwelling on your past doesn't change your past. Replaying the pain and the injustice doesn't correct that pain or injustice and it doesn't change you. And it doesn't change me. Now, here's the deal. Anger can be a very good Thing. Shouting out, crying out, screaming out for justice is a very good thing. Acknowledging the hurt and the pain in your life and what you feel like you lost or what you feel like was owed to you, that can be a very good thing. So resentment can be a teacher. Resentment can be a catalyst for positive change in our life and really to deal with resentment in an honest way before God and before others. You have to go back and acknowledge the hurt and acknowledge the injustice. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's unrealistic not to. I don't think God wants us to, to do that because on one hand, resentment as a teacher shows us what we value that there's a universal sense of right and wrong that's been violated. So of course, the Bible says, be angry, yet don't sin. I'm gonna give my own translation of that. Be angry, but don't be angry too long. We can't live in resentment world forever because it will kill us and destroy us and it affects our relationship with others and also obviously our relationship with God. So what do we do about resentment? What do we do about this barrier? Where's the, the breakthrough? Well, I've been saving these three short verses for the conclusion of this series today. I think the three verses that will lay out the breakthrough for us are arguably three of the most important verses in the entire Bible on relationships. It's in Ephesians chapter number four, 
verses 30 through 32. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. It will lay out for us a breakthrough. Now here's what's important about breakthroughs. A breakthrough is not magic. Sometimes I listen to preachers. Sometimes I watch so-called Christian TV and I'm like, mm, that sounds like magic to me. When people talk about just do this, say this, and bang, magic, everything's better. That's, I don't think that's the way it works. Most of the time, we have to work out what God has worked into us. And yes, God does break through. We have a moment of clarity, an aha, eureka moment. But usually we have to work that out in the rugged planes of reality in our life. Does that make sense? So as we've been looking at these breakthroughs, you know, humility, mission, uh, taking action, this other breakthrough we're gonna look at, let, let me say this, it is a process that we're engaging in. It's a movement of, the, of our heart and a movement of our life or, or a path we take. Does that make sense? Rather than, you know, abracadabra, we're all better. Have a nice day. Doesn't work that way. So. Meanwhile, back to the sermon, back to Ephesians 4, okay? Ephesians 4.30, check this out. Phenomenal verse, phenomenal passage. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve God's Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of it. Bitterness, synonym, see resentment. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, Brawling. I like that. I don't know what that means. It's like it. Brawling. Get rid of the brawling. Slander. That means telling the truth about someone to hurt them, along with every form of malice. Check out verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you, or just as God forgave you. So if the barrier is resentment, the breakthrough is resolve. Resolve. You're saying, resolve, that's it? That's all you got for me, resolve? Yes, resolve. It's not fancy, it's not flashy, but with God's grace, it works. You say resolve what? Resolve, resolve to take a new path. Resolve and refuse not to go to the old path, not to go down the old road, not to say, play my resentment playlist, not to go back and to replay those tapes, those emotions, those angers, but to go down this new path that Ephesians 4 lays out which is a path of getting rid of bitterness, getting rid of malice and learning to live in forgiveness and joy and compassion. Now, let me say this. We're, we're all at different places here today when it comes to dealing with resentment. Some of us here are in, if you have to look at this as stages, some of us are in the stage where we're still dealing with our anger, we're dealing with the injustice, or perhaps you're dealing with sadness and you're dealing with grief, and that's where you are, and that's where you need to be. Others of us, to simplify the continuum here, are in a stage where we have been hanging on to a resentment. We've been hanging on to some bitterness. We've been hanging on to some unforgiveness way, way too long. And it's eating our lunch. It's eating us up. So, so when you hear these, this, this call to resolve, it's a resolve, like I said, to enter into a process with God and others. It's taking a first step down this new path. Now, a lot of you are already down that path. 
You're already down that path. You could get up here and go, let me tell you, right? Let me tell you my story of what bitterness and resentment did in my life. And let me tell you when I went down this new path and how God has changed my life and changed my relationships. Many of you can stand up here and say and testify as we say about that. So no matter where we are, how do, how do we... How do we start going down this path? What is this path gonna look like for us? First of all, this path is gonna be a path of forgiveness. And we're gonna have to learn, learn forgiveness. Because forgiveness is not easy. For forgiveness can be arduous. Forgiveness can be painful. But we have to, as we're going down this path, as, as we make this resolve, we have to understand and begin to learn how to forgive. And when you forgive someone, basically you're releasing them from a debt you perceive they owe you. Hey, Jesus, how should we pray? Pray, forgive people of their debts as you forgive those who debt against you. It's in the Lord's Prayer we have to learn how to forgive. Also, we have to live and grow in kindness. Be kind one to another. Some people are born with a healthy bent towards kindness. Do you know kind people in your life? You need some kind people in your life, right? Some of us are, are not really born that kind. We're not even kinda kind, okay? And we have to work on kindness. We have to work on it. How can I be kind? I, I'm not naturally kind. That's not who I am. That's not my Enneagram, okay? That's not my wing. Um, be thoughtful, be thoughtful. Listen more, talk less. Do small, as we say, not so random acts of kindness for others around you. Little things. Hold your tongue. When you mess up and you do something wrong, don't say sorry. Remember, say I am sorry. Forgive me. Kindness. Learn to forgive. Live in kindness as we're going down this new path to get rid of this bitterness and resentment. And the last thing we have to do is we have to let God handle it. You gotta let God handle this. I discovered a long time ago that unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment is bigger than me, stronger than me, tougher than me, and just hangs on. It's bigger than me. What do you mean by that? I, I can't cope with the bitterness and unforgiveness on my own. I need God's help. I've got to turn it over to God. I've got to let God be God and let me be me. This little old me. Trusting God. Going down this new path. Asking for his help. Learning how to forgive. Learning how to live in kindness. And saying, God, you're a just God. God, you're a, a merciful God. Your court of justice is perfect and I'm gonna leave so many of those things to you and just turn that over to you. God, you're a God of mercy and love and compassion. God, I turn all of this big, hot mess. I take all my fear, all my anger, all my bitterness and I turn it over to you. And you continue to do that. And you continue to refuse to play the tapes, to drink that poison. We refuse to do it. About 15 or 16 years ago, I was having a coffee with a friend of mine. And the friend of mine, just he happened to be a surgeon, okay? And, and surgeons, they, they love to cut things. They do. That's their solution to a medical problem is 
surgery, okay? I've got a cold. Let me see if I can cut that out, all right? Let me cut it. So we were having a coffee there. He goes, hey, what's that? What's that in your ear? He's pointing to this ear here. I go, I don't know, scab or something. He goes, that doesn't look very good. Why don't you come down to my shop, office, doctor shop, and uh, I need to look at it. It's no big deal. It's okay. So he looked at it. He goes, I'm going to biopsy it. It's no big deal. I'm going to cut it. I think I got it. Biopsy it. I wait two weeks. He goes, man, you're not going to believe this. There's, there's something there. Why don't you come back down to my office and let me cut on it some more and we'll biopsy it again. It's okay. Went down, second time, cut on it. He goes, I'm 90% sure I got it. I go, great. Wait two weeks. I always got to wait. And uh, the third time he goes, he goes, Ben, he goes, you have cancer. Yeah. And, and this is not, I, I haven't told the story much at all because it's not, to me, real cancer like some of you are dealing with and struggling with right now or have been through. But it was kind of a, a, a cancer basal right near the, my ear canal, which is not good because it could creep out and get inside you know, my, my little brain. So he goes, you gotta have surgery. Yikes, right? So I had to wait. I remember when I was waiting to have surgery, I remember thinking to myself, my thought was this. It was, it was almost like well, I was kind of stoic in a sense that I was like, I just want this out of me. Whatever this cancer is, wherever it is, I just want him to cut it out and to get it out of me because I don't want it to grow. It's bitterness, resentment. God cut it out of me. Well, God cut it out of you. You just want it to get rid of it. You don't want it to infect your body, your life, your soul, your heart, and spill out and affect those around you. God, get rid of this. Because one day we're, we're, we're gonna die. We will die. And the, and the question about our death is really, how, how will we die? In other words, not literally how we die, but how will our hearts be when we die? You see, Jesus died before he died. He died before he died. He died in the garden. He made the choice in the garden when he was struggling, not my will, but thy will be done. He died before he died. Therefore, on the cross, he is able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He made the choice to die with a heart of compassion and forgiveness and kindness rather than to die with a heart of bitterness and, un and unforgiveness. Ronald Roheiser puts it this way. Here's what he says in this quote. He says, how will I die? Will I die angry, bitter, and unforgiving? Or will I die with a warm and forgiving heart? We have to die before we die. We have to let go and get rid of that resentment and experience that resurrection of joy and life and healing that God has for us as we take that new path.